Broadwater Reporter, and on behalf of the Broadwater Rod and Gun Club and the Broadwater Reporter, we'd like to welcome you tonight to the Commissioner's Candidate Forum. We appreciate you taking the time to come out to learn something about the candidates that's going to be, could be serving you, the citizens of Broadwater County, and we have some rules that we put on the chair. We would hope that you uh, would cooperate with us so that everybody can have an enjoyable night. Um, our moderator, Gayanna Mazzola, will be going over those. Uh, we kindly ask that you follow those rules. Um, if for some reason you find it necessary that you must break the rules and not adhere to them, Sheriff Ludwig will step in and help us out with that. <laughs> I would like to thank our candidates, Tim Ravendell, Roger Halver, and Laura Obert for coming out tonight, our moderator, Gayanne Mazzola, our timekeeper, Judith Binkley. Uh, in just a minute, Ms. Mazzola will go over the structure we have tonight. Uh, but first, if you will rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And anyone with cell phones, would you please turn them off or turn them to vibrate? And uh, in the case of an emergency, our emergency exits are here and there's a couple in the back. Don't anticipate anything, but just so you know, <laughs> here's my flight attendant stuff. So there's no lights down the runway. So Ms. Mazzola will kindly tell everyone the structure. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. And we really want to thank Trudy and the Broadwater Reporter because they have worked so hard at the Broadwater Rod and Gun Club. We really appreciate you putting this on. And then a big thanks to the candidates because it, I think it's very brave when you throw your hat in the ring and run and you're out there in front of the public. So thank you for running. And also thank you audience members. I really appreciate you coming because it shows that you're interested before you mark that ballot. And I, that shows. Okay, Trudy wants me to go over these. I think you can all read. You're an intelligent looking audience, but just in case. We will start with the question that we sent in. And in order to keep from speaking over other people, please wait for the moderator to recognize you before asking your question. And the questions need to be directed to all the candidates. It's not going to be just so you can zero in on one, but all candidates will answer that question. No questions will be allowed that are only directed to one candidate. No questions regarding past issues, except as a reference. So you won't be asking questions about the present lawsuit, because that is probably something that will be handled a little bit. No questions. Oh, well, there she is. I should have had, I read these over. Okay. Uh, we have two candidates that are not here tonight. So they asked for uh, this to be read. Uh, the first one's from Curtis Batsarath. Curtis Batsarath. Curtis Cesari couldn't be here tonight. He had a prior commitment that could not be rescheduled. He did send a statement to be read. My name is Curtis Batsarath. I have lived my entire life, almost 60 years in Broward County, married to another county native, Susan. We have been happily married for 37 years and counting. During those years, we have farmed and ranched, having both good years and bad years. We learned how to budget, do without, and overcome whatever obstacles arose. Two of our greatest accomplishments are our grown children, Daniel and Melissa. We were all educated in and graduated from the town and school system. I got my strong work ahead ethic for my dad. When he was ready to go to work, I was expected to be ready too. And on the farm, we got up early, worked hard all day, and usually got back to the house after dark. He also taught me to work with what we had. We couldn't always buy the parts we needed. Instead, we used welding rod to fix or fabricate the part we needed to replace. For several years, I wanted to run for county commissioner. When several others approached me and said I should run, I decided now was the time. I believe my participation on the county weed board, rural fire board, search and rescue farming, and as a volunteer fireman has given me the experience needed to be county commissioner. 
As Royal Fire Board Chairman, I had to lead meetings, handle disciplinary actions, and work along with the other board members to create the budget for the operation of the Royal Fire District, using the amount of mills we were allowed. We had used common sense, cooperation, and compromise to work through the process. Good qualities I've learned and practiced through the years. If elected county commissioner, I believe that I can work with the other commissioners and other officials and employees to make our county a better place to live and work by using common sense, cooperation, and compromise. Okay, this is from Terry Lewis. To all of you attending here tonight, thank you. It shows you care where our county is going. I chose not to be here tonight as I have been knocking on doors. I met, I met a lady that just retired from working for a Montana County attorney after 20 years. She said the attorney she worked for would not do forums or debates either. No matter how good a speaker or a debater they are does not mean they will be a good leader. I feel knocking on doors and meeting people in person is the way to be elected. I feel we need changes. That is why so many are running. The voters are the ones that will decide June 3rd who they feel they can trust and guide this county for the next six years. Thank you from a concerned candidate, Terry D. Lewis. Okay. Okay. Um, the candidates have drawn for the order in which they're going to do their introductions. Laura Obert drew first, Tim Ravendahl drew second, and Roger Helbert drew third. They will be allowed five minutes to do their introductions, and then they will be allowed three minutes to answer the question. And then we'll have questions from the audience, and Judy will do a tremendous job of timing. <laughs> okay, Laura. And then when we do the closing, we'll do the reversal. We'll start from the bottom up. All right. Um, first off, can you guys hear me, or do I need to use this? Use this? All right. is really the CEO of the county. Our job is to manage a $12 million budget. The most power we have over that budget is really just $2 million of it. We directly supervise 11 department heads and by extension are responsible for another 60 employees, full-time, part-time, temporary, and seasonal. Employees have got to be able to do their job. They've got to be able to get training so that they are proficient in doing those jobs. And they've got to be able to let other people do their jobs. Our jobs as supervisors is to motivate our employees and give them the training that they need so that they are proficient up on the laws and understand the regulations that they need to work within. But the number one thing that we need to do for our employees is lead by example. We have got to put in the time to do our homework. We've got to understand the issues and we've got to work more hours than we're paid for. All of the most important decisions for the entire county come before the county commissioners. Understanding the issues today as well as the history and what our decisions will mean 20 and 50 years from now is essential to making the decisions. There's a lot of different things that have happened through the years since I was first elected five and a half years ago. One of the first things I did upon getting elected was get the meeting minutes in the paper on a weekly basis so that people had a more firm understanding of what we did in our meetings. We've taken another step this last year and the meetings are now on YouTube. They're videotaped and you can watch exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it at your convenience at any time as long as you have the internet. We also started doing the Pledge of Allegiance during my first term of office. As far as the budget goes, there's a couple of things that we've been doing differently that I think are a lot 
less wasteful than the way things used to be. Number one, we got rid of the use it or lose it practice of the past. This is a wasteful practice, and what we do now is any department head who is responsible and frugal with your money, at the end of the budget uh, year, the fiscal year, any leftover money is put into a capital account. That capital account then can be saved by that department head over the years to pay for expensive one-time expenditures like computers, weapons, equipment. The other thing we did is we tried, we tied department heads' budgets to mills instead of leaving those as a wish list. What happened is the past is department heads would put together a wish list of what they wanted in their budget rather than what they needed. So they're tied to mills, they have a parameter they need to work within, and uh, it's made it a whole lot more easy and peaceful process to get the budget done. Last year's budget, budget process was probably the smoothest we've had since I was first elected five and a half years ago. These ideas are not something we come up with. They're something that we learn by networking with other county commissioners and through associations like the Montana Association of Counties. They also come from working on other boards. Taking nuggets of good ideas that are done up other places and bringing them home to Broadwater County makes good managerial sense. Four years ago, the governor appointed me to the board of Montana Board of Crime Control, and the Senate supported that appointment. Two years ago, I was appointed chair of the Montana Board of Crime Control. When I first was elected commissioner, I served on the Agency on Aging, and my fellow governing board members are fellow commissioners from an eight-county region. They appointed me chair two years ago. They have, on both boards, I was appointed to chairmanship for three reasons. One is I understand the issues. Two, I'm willing to do the homework. And three, I'm able to get along and work well with others. As you listen to us tonight, interview for this position of county commissioner, Think about your own personal finances and who you would want managing your budgets, because it is your money. My name is Laura Olbert, and I'm your county commissioner. I'm running for re-election based on my qualifications, my leadership, and my experience. And I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Do I need this? Um, yes. uh, thank you very much for the Broad Rider Reporter for bringing us up together this evening. Thanks for the Rod and Gun Club for this great facility. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tim Ravendahl. I've been a resident of Broadwater County since 1985 when I moved here with my, my wife, Chris, who's in the audience here. Um, and we raised our three children. Um, one of which is in the audience here this evening. Uh, through the Townsend School System, been involved in, in that process uh, since kindergarten with uh, Ms. Turcott. Uh, I served in the United States Air Force, so I'm a veteran, and veterans come really very specially close to my heart. Um, I, I abs absolutely spend a lot of my time promoting veterans and, and their due service that they have coming. Uh, after coming to Townsend, I came into this area, went to work for Valley Sales as a mechanic, um, and after several years, I opened up my own business and served the community here as a mechanic for quite a few years. I really loved that particular field, but I, as sometimes we do get um, an urge to move on, and the woods started calling me, and I transferred my career into the logging industry. Townsend is very special to the logging industry, as we used to have, uh, at one time, five different sawmills here, supporting the infrastructure of this community and the infrastructure of the county. Uh, we're down to one, and that one uh, facility is, is working hard to try and survive uh, the process of, of obtaining uh, product for the mill. My business, Small Tree Logging, I've been working in that industry up until recently uh, and has been a very successful. Uh, 
most businesses have a hard time paying for themselves, especially in this economy, but that, that has been very um, instrumental in my experience in leadership. Uh, in running a business, uh, certainly one does understand the bottom line. If you don't make money, you don't stay in business very long. Uh, 20 years of owning my own business uh, test for my leadership ability in that. So, uh, I have been involved in politics, if you will, and I hate the word because politicians are um, really kind of a dirty word in many households. Uh, I prefer the different terms, but without getting into details there, I've been involved in, in, uh, in the government, that's a better way to put it, uh, since 1972. I got engaged with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks back in 1972 on wildlife management issues, and that struck a, a nerve in me uh, that showed that government is a, is a beast in its own right that is only controlled by the people that show up. And so I found a, a very successful opportunity in that young period in my life to make a difference. Um, and and I, I jumped on the opportunity and, and it stuck with me ever since. Uh, I have been directly involved um, with the Montana legislature as a citizen lobbyist, which is a lot different than uh, many of them that are at the Capitol, because I don't represent anyone. I don't really owe my life or my soul to a company store, so to speak. Um, many lobbyists uh, will come forward and end up having, um, okay, I'm being paid to do this and I'm being paid to represent this particular side of this issue. I've gone to the legislature representing you guys. I've gone there looking at our rights under the Constitution. I've gone there looking at my opportunity to move forward. I've been directly involved in Broadwater County local government for the past 15 years and I have been actively involved in every department in looking at where we're at, looking at what works, looking at what does not work, and I have a full understanding of what we need to do to better our community and build a team that will make our community and our county better for the future. Uh, and I'll be certainly around for quite a long time after this and in the coming days for any questions. Thank you very much for coming tonight. God bless America. because I moved to Broadwater County four years ago, almost to this day. I moved from here from East Helena, and I immediately fell in love with Broadwater County. My wife and I have what I call our, our dream retirement home in the Pearl Creek area. And I came to know some of the citizens of Broadwater County, and you're very, very, very fine people. Another thing I appreciate about Broadwater County is its taxes. I was amazed. We uh, moved out of about approximately a $180,000 home in East Helena into approximately a $400,000 home, our dream home, up in the Pearl Creek area. Our taxes were half of what I was paying in East Helena. As a candidate for county commissioner, I will do everything possible to protect you hardworking citizens that pay your taxes because I so appreciate the fact that our taxes are low in this county. I want to keep it that way. As far as my experience for county commissioner, I was a field rep for a congressman, and through that work, my major duties were health care, I was a liaison to the cities, and I was a liaison to the counties. And that in the work of being a liaison to the cities and counties, I really came to know the issues of Montana and their counties. I probably interviewed, probably sat with, uh, there's 52 counties in this, in this state, I probably sat with 40 of those 52 com commissions and discussed their issues, their problems that they had, and I reported back to the congressman concerning them. I realized what the problems of the counties are. A lot of the problems are um, unfunded mandates. 
A lot of the problems are with the pet money. A lot of the problems are with the rules that are made at the legislature against the counties. So I'm very familiar with those, those issues concerning counties, and I, I, that's one of my qualifications. Second qualification is um, I was a lobbyist for five, section, five sessions at the state legislature. Now I know oftentimes lobbyists have a bad name, but I'm proud of my lobbying work. I work for the Montana Association of Realtors and the Montana Landlords Association. From that, I learned about the inner workings of government. I learned how to compromise. I learned how to disagree or to agree with those you disagree with. And I learned how to make a, make a point, not through, not through political muscle, but through explaining myself very well on issues and, and not swaying people with my explanations on issues, but letting them know all the facts. And as a former lobbyist, as close as we are to Helena, I think I could really serve this county quite well at the legislature, with Mako, working on the issues that are important to this county and are important to, to Mako. My third qualification is that I headed up the Medicare anti-fraud program in Colorado, Utah, and um, Montana for five years. This was a huge program. It had a budget of $1.8 million. The good news is we, had, we were adequately funded. The bad news is I saw the government waste our taxpayers' tax dollars. It was amazing how much waste was in that program. And if I'm elected to county commissioner, you can be assured that with the budget of this county, there won't be any waste in that. So I thank you all and appreciate your consideration. And it's good to see as many people as there are here tonight. This is a off um, presidential election year. This is a primary. I'm really proud of the citizens of this county for showing up at an event like this. Thank you.
that we are paid PILT. It is the federal government's property taxes for their property. Not only is it Montana that's reliant on PILT, PILT is actually spent or paid to every single county, or excuse me, every single state in the U.S. So we're not alone on this. As far as counties that use PILT to balance their budgets, that's actually by and large most of them. There would be a lot of counties that would go bankrupt without PILT. So the actuality of losing PILT is probably going to slim. But what we try and do is be very responsible with it. Keep a surplus so that if it were to happen, you guys wouldn't feel it. The county would still operate just fine. Um, so again, 413 today in the PILT account, 550 approximately coming next month. And Broadwater County has no debt. Thank you. I'm glad this question come up, folks. Um, PILT has, has been uh, an issue here in Broadwater County for as long as I've lived here. It's been a part of our budget very process. It is an in intricate part of the revenue process, sometimes not directly, and oftentimes not directly, but it is a is a part of the of the revenue source that we have that comes in to help offset some of the needs of the infrastructure. Uh, PILT has been um, cut and, and partially funded since its inception. Uh, we have lost uh, our, it, it kind of dances with the SRS funding, which is our funding that goes to our schools and, and our infrastructure, other places as well. And so Title three, two, and one funding that comes out of that, <coughs> spending a lot of time on that to explain it would be all night. But it, in, in some ways it's disingenuous to say that we don't depend on that because sometimes things come up and our budgets don't match. For example, we recently inherited a major problem with the horse issue. Um, and that horse issue depended on our ability to take money from PIL to offset the uh, approved budget for the safety department um, in creating a, a surplus, if you will, not a surplus, I don't use the right words all the time, but what I'm meaning is without that funding sitting there available, um, our sheriff department would have been really in a tight budget to not only care for those horses and pay for the bills associated with those, but to continue moving forward in a positive direction. Um, our departments have often come before uh, the uh, the commission looking for additional funding and that is the source of that additional funding. Uh, budgets can be set and, and are in, in early June, finalized at the end of June, and, and we end up having a, a pretty good recipe to move forward. But what we end up having is we have a fund that is there, but it is not by any means solid. It was appropriated to be included in the farm bill this year, and this is a one-time opportunity to say, hey, here we are, we could be losing that uh, very shortly because if that farm bill um, dies on the vine like it did, uh, nearly did here very closely, we could lose that funding completely. And there's other problems legally that uh, could stop our PILT funding coming in here and we need to be very careful that we don't um, forget where that comes from. It's tax dollars and we've got to make sure we spend that wisely. Thank you. <coughs> I was looking at the video from Congressman being a liaison to cities and counties, especially counties. Health was the number one issue that I had to deal with and was informed on. As a matter of fact, it's much more of an issue in the western part of the state than it is in the eastern part of the state. Much more of the western part of the state is under the control of the Forest Service, the BLM, National Parks, Eastern part of the state, much more of the land is privately owned, so they don't have that problem. I'm very concerned about PILT. I'm very concerned about our national government at this, pro at this <coughs> point and what's going on there. I don't really have the answers to PILT, but I am concerned about it. The, um, I guess I'm going to speak generally concerning our national government and the the deadlock that is there. That's what has me most concerned. What I, what I feel from working for a congressman
congressman is that most of the people in national government come from large metropolitan areas and not rural areas. We in this county are very much a rural area. Our numbers are few. I don't feel we're properly represented. represented. I don't have the solutions for that, but yes, PILT will continue to be a problem until we can end the deadlock in Washington and make those people realize that we in Montana, you know, we're part of the system too. Um, like I said, I am very well informed on PILT, but I don't have the answers. But I do congratulate the, pre the present commissioners and what they've done as far as the budget in this county. Thank you. If you are elected, excuse <coughs> me, or re-elected commissioner, do you see your role as one where you actively promote population growth, actively discourage population growth, or simply work to properly manage whichever occurs? We rotate, right? Or do I always go first? Uh, you know, well, I don't think that's quite fair. We'll go, we'll, we'll have chance, or no, Roger. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> we'll rotate. The management of population growth. As I stated, I was a lobbyist for Montana Association of Realtors and got to know those issues quite well. Population growth. I've noticed from the from the statistics in this population in the in this county that the county is growing. I'm one of those people that have moved into this county. I'm one of those people who bought seven acres and put a house on it. I'm not anti-growth. What I'm for is quality growth. And I saw what Lewis and Clark County was doing as far as growth with all the rules and regulations, their special fees, things like that. I'm against that. But I talked with one of the um, commissioners in Lewis and Clark County, and he made a statement that kind of uh, uh, sent me back. He said, Roger, when somebody builds a house in, in the county, the tax dollars that they pay for that property, let's say that for every dollar they pay for that property, it costs the county $1.47 in building new roads and road maintenance to service that property owner. That's a problem. Again, I, I don't have solutions, but I'm aware of the problems. And yes, let's have growth. Let's have well-managed growth. Let's not have obstruction as far as growth. Um, thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, as far as population growth, we have had a couple of major issues here in the county on subdivision planning, and, and we've certainly learned from some mistakes that were made. Uh, we need to continue to enhance that learning process and, and make sure that we uh, provide the, the necessary knowledge and, and expertise uh, moving forward into the planning process so that we do uh, do the best service to the citizens of Broadwater County. When we create a new subdivision, we always have, and not necessarily in this order, we have concerns over fire, uh, sewer, solid waste, and probably most importantly, public safety. So those are all cost, direct costs on our infrastructure, and we need to make sure that we are prepared to do that. Um, and most of the times, these costs can be associated and are directly um, pulled in through uh, the, the creation of the subdivision through fees and or um, a, a process that sets that up. So when we get there, um, Broadwater County has a moratorium on new county roads, so we don't really have an expected increase in county obligations um, to these, but we do have services that we do provide to these subdivisions. As far as, as far as growth goes, I will adamantly and aggressively promote industry to come to Broadwater County that will absolutely create growth that will pay the bills in Broadwater County and, and help offset those costs that are ever increasing on each and every one of you taxpayers. And with that, I'm again, always open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad there's three 
choices. I grew up in Haver in the 80s, and uh, Highline is still experiencing what Haver was experiencing back then, and that is almost on a weekly basis, stores and restaurants were being boarded up. It's a pretty scary environment for a kid thinking about their future. Um, I haven't been back to Haver much since, but I understand it's doing better with the Balkan. There's the other extreme. Fast growth, too fast growth. You guys have all heard the stories coming out of the Bakken. I don't need to go into that in any kind of detail. What we want is the middle of the road. What we want is good, smart growth. We want managed growth. What we want is good business growth that complements the, the quality of life that we built here in Broadwater County. Small manufacturing, recreational type growth. And we have some of that going right now. Uh, Land Tamer is doing very well. In fact, uh, there will be some changes uh, that will be good for this community. We have a new community uh, business that just moved in on the town, the old Perry building. Uh, we have a hay building uh, and business south of town. This is what we want. This is what we want for our community. And the simple reason is taxes and quality of life. When we have good, responsible growth, what we have is a seesaw. More people coming in, paying more money through businesses. What happens then is individuals need to pay less. There's a finite bucket, and the valuation of the county is a solid number. So when new manufacturing and recreational businesses come in and they're paying more, individuals are paying less. Last year, anyone who noticed your property taxes noticed that they went down 8.5% on average across the board. That's what we want. That is the, the product of realized and managed <coughs> responsible growth. <coughs> Can all three get done? Give them a hand. Okay, this time it'll be Jim. Uh, the public comment resolution that is currently read at the beginning of each meeting seems to reduce the citizens to a role of silent observers after the public, com public comment period. What are your plans to allow regular citizens more of a vo voice and still maintain the kind of order needed to conduct a meeting? Uh, those of you that know me um, are probably aware that I attend each of the meetings um, every Monday and I am fully apprised on what's going on there with that particular situation. We are allowed as citizens three minutes at the beginning of each meeting as Jan mentioned. Um, the, the timer is set and if you don't get done with your time, um, basically too bad. Another problem is, is we just don't ever really get an opportunity to get um, a direct re um, response from the entire commission. We need to make sure that that changes. This is a full three-person commission. This is not anything that can be done without a full cooperation of all three working together, and all three have a position on that. The United States Constitution, as well as our Montana Constitution, provide for that open process. And under our Constitution, Article 8, Sections 2, sec, uh, Sections 8 and 9, excuse me, right to know and right to participate, not only provide for that, but in the statute that backs up those parts of the Constitution, for specifically says that we will encourage participation. That is absolutely a need and a must in order for each and every one of you folks to come in and have a comfortable, uh, open process where you feel comfortable to come in before the people that you have hired to hear your concerns. Without that opportunity, uh, the system is broken and we need to move forward and fix that in a hurry. It is obviously and definitely broken right now and I will work hard to make sure that that changes giving everyone a full opportunity to participate in our government because it is for the people and by the people. Thank you. Laura? Uh, the open meeting policy. We started this about uh, six months ago or so and the reason was that our meetings were becoming violent. 
Our law enforcement is aware of this because we were having to have deputies sit in on our meetings on a weekly basis, not only for the protection of us, but the protection of the people coming to see us and the protection of our employees who would work just down the hall. The meetings that Tim described are not the meetings that I've been to uh, as far as after that policy was adopted. Any item on the agenda that is of, quote, public significant interest we open up to public comment. And that is pretty much every single agenda item. <coughs> if it's an item that requires a vote, we do take a first and a second and then public discussion from the public. Public hearings take unlimited and untimed public comment. Uh, Tim said that he wanted people to feel comfortable in the meetings. Isn't safety a feel comfortable? Shouldn't our public that comes to see us, shouldn't our partners, Shouldn't the people who are citizens look, look, looking on in the audience feel comfortable and feel safe? It's essential. Um, oh, and YouTube. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Tim's word for it. Check it out for yourselves. Look at YouTube. See how much public comment we take in a meeting. See how structured the meetings are now and how less violent they are than they have been for almost an entire year there. YouTube.com, subject line at the top, <coughs> I've been Broadwater County Commissioners. Double click on the blue box at the top of the page and then you will see the most recent meeting right at the very top. Double click and you can watch what's happening for yourself and make up your own mind. Thank you. I'm going to take a little bit of, a little different angle on this question. I have sat in the commission meetings for about three months and observed what is going on in the commission meetings. I would like to invite all of you, and I mean all of you, to start coming to the commission meetings. The commission meetings, the people that show up each week are a small, boisterous number who represent very narrow issues in this county. Both Commissioner, both commissioners of order and gravely need your support at that county commission meetings. They need to hear your words of encouragement rather than the words of discouragement that come out of those who are now regularly attending the meetings. They really do need your support. The meetings, the question about the open meetings and public comment at the beginning, Laura is, is absolutely correct. There is public comment at the beginning. But there's also public comment whenever an issue is being voted on. But again, they're only hearing from a few disgruntled citizens in this county. They have every right to say what they say at the meeting. But also, again, all of you out there, I know you have jobs. I know it's hard to make a Monday morning meeting. But please, start showing up and supporting these commissioners. They are working hard on your behalf and they need your support. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll go on then for a little bit and then we'll take questions from the audience. What do you believe is the most pressing issue facing the county going forward, and how would you propose to address this issue? And this time, I guess we're back to you, Laura. All right. The most pressing issue is uh, not the budget. The budget is strong. Um, departments are well balanced at this point, and we're sitting okay with PILT. The most pressing thing that we're facing right now is the discourse in our community that's playing out every week in our meetings. We have been in touch with the Division of Criminal Investigation. We have been in touch with investigators who worked with the, through the Freeman situation in the 1990s. We've been in touch with other communities going through the same thing. There is a training going on right now, and I think some of our citizens have probably taken it. And it is a training to teach people how to bring local governments to their knees. 
We are not alone. There's other county commissions, there's other city commissions, there's fire districts, hospitals, school boards, all across the state and the region going through this. These tactics have been seen before, and they culminated in the 1990s with the Freeman standoff in Jordan. My concern is that if we don't find some way to come together again as a community, to get rid of the vitriol, to find a way to cut through the lies in the weekly newspaper, that we are going to find ourselves the next Jordan or Lincoln. Those communities will never again outlive their past of the Unabomber and the Freeman to be just communities. They will always be known and branded. I don't want that for Broadwater County. This is my area of deepest concern for us. <laughs> As much as there are obstructionists on the left, and by obstructionists I define those people on the left, those environmentalists who say no to every project, to timber harvest, to mines, no is their only answer and solution. There are also obstructionists on the right, and they are sitting in at their commission meetings, and their answer to everything is no, their answer to everything is dissension, their answer to everything is strife. So again, I call upon the good citizens of this county to start attending the county commission meetings and offset those people. Yes, they have a right to speak up, but so do the other citizens of the county. And again, I say the commissioners in this county, Commissioner Gravely, Commissioner Obert, need your support. I sat in on, on commission meetings for three months and I saw firsthand and personally what goes on at those meetings. I invite all of you who haven't been to those meetings, come to one of those, those meetings. See what these obstructionists are doing to this county and the problems they are ca causing. I think we're all three on the same page here. Um, our meetings and the process that we're currently going under is broken and we need to fix it. I will bring leadership to the table that will bring us forward in having an opportunity to sit down and bring common sense into the factor and take care of this behind closed doors. A lot of these personal disagreements that we've been reading about in the paper, that we've been hearing about, that's being portrayed um, as being the problem with our commission meetings, all, if not, if not all of them, could be absolutely handled if we would just knock it off and stand up and start doing the right thing. Now, if you don't have a communication program in place for your elected officials to sit down and, and work together, uh, then that three-legged stool is broken and it will not stand up. We need to fix that. We need to make sure that we move forward and that Every member of the commission is doing their fair share so that we don't have this um, finger pointing. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's broken. We need to make sure that we build a team. And, and that's the key to making sure that this ends and that we get forward. Without a team, we are individuals striking off into the forest and we don't get anywhere. We need to make sure that we're standing on the best interest of the citizens individually. If we want to start looking at pointing fingers at something that's radical or, or extreme or out of place, um, you know, that's not the way to take care of business. That's, that just fuels the fire. We need to remove the catalyst from the fire so that we can stand up tomorrow and, and start bringing things back together here in Broadwater County. Thank you. One more question, then we'll take questions from the audience. Do you see a need to create a new manager position to assist the commission in performing its duties? If so, why? If not, why not? And Roger, you're first. <laughs> I feel like this question is directed straight toward me, and I'm more than glad to answer it. I sat, in the, I sat in the commission meetings for over two months and recognized 
that this commission needs a good manager in it. Let's talk about Ravalli County. Ravalli County does not have a chief administrative officer. Ravalli County is in a mess right now as far as their treasure being behind in paying, paying bills. Their county is a mess because there is no direct administrator. The county commissioners are not administrators. This county needs a chief administrative officer. Let's take a look at um, Jefferson County. Recently, Jefferson County, the treasurer, was indicted for embezzling over $100,000 in fees. If there had been a chief administrative officer in that county monitoring what was going on in that county, that would have been taken care of well ahead of that fact. Again, the county commissioners are not administrators. <coughs> I put my name forward as the Chief Administrative Officer. I did it because I saw a need in this county. I have never in my life come under such vile attack for just offering an op opportunity to the county. This county needs a Chief Administrative Officer. At the last county commission meeting, there was a letter read for me where I withdrew my name from consideration for that chief administrative officer position. Because this county is so broken because of the strife in the commission and the obstructionists who are going to the meeting, the obstructionists that are writing letters to the editor, that I would not, wouldn't want the, the position. In fact, I congratulate Commissioner Gravely and Commissioner Obert for their work on the commission and putting up with all of this strife and dissent that is going on in the commission. This county is broken and it needs to be healed. Uh, Tim? My answer is no. We do not need a, uh, a manager and I'm proud to say no because if we have a commission in place that has a teamwork that's working with other elected officials, the job gets done. We don't need to be adding another employee to the county to do the job that's already charged to the three commissioners. It has to be a team. We need to make that move forward, and then that's the only way we get it done without costing the taxpayers more money. involved in what's called county office restructuring now since the beginning of the year. What we're doing is we're investigating what we need in the county and how to best provide that, not only for our employees but for you and do it as, as fiscally responsibly as we can. We recently lost our finance officer and opted not to refill that position. What we did instead is we took all those different jobs and put them out to different employees already in employment in the county. The savings off the top is about 70 grand a year. There was some question, do we need a secretary? Do we need an administrative assistant? My opinion is no, but it's something we're investigating right now. Another question came up is what about HR? Human resources and personnel services. We had a gentleman that came to speak to us in early February who was going to provide those service for us by contract for about $14,400 a year. That looked real attractive to me. The vitriol in the uh, audience that he received uh, actually resulted in him saying, no, I'm not going to work for Broadwater County in any way, shape, or form. So we've had another conference call with another HR specialist, and she was much better received. Uh, that, I think, is a much more responsible way to go. It's less expensive, but it does put a lot more responsibility on the elected officials. I don't think that's a bad thing. We are supposed to be professionals. We are supposed to be able to learn how to handle the personnel issues within our own departments. She is going to offer training if she is brought on board. Um, if we are able to do that, it's going to be on a trial basis. We'll be able to give that a few months and see if that will work for us. If not, we'll go back to investigating and trying to figure out what the best course of action is and the best way to move forward. But Tim is right. We are professionals and we all need to be pulling our weight. 
We can't have a commissioner that just shows up on Mondays to see what happens without having done any homework. We've got way too much work to do and all three commissioners need to be putting in more hours than we're paid for. So again, my answer at this point is I don't know, but we're investigating. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> now we'll open it up to questions from the audience. You'll be allowed one question, so we don't have um, over monopolizing. Okay. Well, I think we need a break the end for a little more humor. Uh, <laughs> I've long been searching rest for you, and uh, I think this has been brought to the commissioners already, the present commissioners, and we need a bathroom for you to have one. You just got to go. We don't have a bathroom. Uh, the, the bill is okay over there by the, the dumpster area. And uh, sometimes we come back in off search and rescue and we don't have a bathroom, we don't have any shower facilities and so on. So I guess my question is, which one of you three folks, if you're elected, will give us a $12,000 bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I Thank you, Dwayne. We are well aware of your issues. <laughs> the thing is, is Dwayne and Search and Rescue are not alone. We have some other similar requirements for some of our other departments. Weed and mosquito go out, they spray with chemical, they come back in, and they are wearing that chemical on their clothing. They get in their personal vehicles, they go home to their personal washing machine, and they put this chemical that they are working at service to you, to us, in their own personal washing machines. What we need to do is provide those people also with bathroom facilities, emergency shower facilities, and washing facilities. What we started a couple months ago is a plan. We have brought search and rescue together with the weed department, mosquito, extension. And we don't have enough room for that. And there's one more. But anyway, what we're doing is we're working on how can we provide these facilities for all of those departments together. Rather than throwing $12,000 at search and rescue, $12,000 at extension, $12,000 at weed, what we would like to do is bring them together. It's a whole lot smaller price tag if we do it smart, with some planning, and with the long view in mind. So, Dwayne, we'll be getting in that bathroom. It's just not going to be tomorrow. I'm holding it. We're <laughs> glad. <laughs> say thank you to all those volunteers that serve on the many boards that are in this county. I appreciate your work. I'd also like to say thank you to all those good county employees. Again, I've been sitting in the county commissioner meetings for about three months now. I've really come to appreciate the hard work of the county employees and the volunteers who sit on all the boards. And yes, wherever there's a need, as far as those volunteers and those employees, let's fill it. Let's give them bathrooms. I mean, that's basic. You know? I think it's an excellent idea to have washing machines in, in those facilities. I served for four years as a ski patrolman in a big sky, and it was a volunteer position. I wasn't paid for it. And uh, we did appreciate all of those things that were provided to us as volunteers. Places to sleep, Places to do our laundry, uh, a well-equipped first aid room, proper equipment that we could use on the mountain to evaluate, to evacuate people. So yes, especially for the volunteers, let's give them what they need because they're they're unpaid and they deserve everything they can get. About 15 years ago, when I first started dealing with our local government here in Broadwater County, I joined the Search and Rescue. Uh, and I'll tell you what, we have come a real long ways in the last 15 years with that very valuable um, arm of our local government. That is a service that this community will never ever be able to pay enough for because it pays for itself times over and over again in, in public safety, in every aspect that I can think of. Dwayne, I think I'm going to just ask everyone here, please pray that we don't lose pill, and then we get enough money so that you don't have to hold it too much longer. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, what's that? 
Yeah. Okay, my question is, I'm Beth Harley, I live in Broward County. Do you believe that the commissioners and the county have a role in the sustainability of our local hospital and the 70 plus jobs that go with it? We have been struggling for multiple years with our hospital and the key word here is sustainability. Um, that meaning of that word often, depending on where it's used, can mean different things. But here in the bottom line, uh, if our hospital is in a sustainable position, um, we are absolutely obligated to continue making forward all of our efforts that we can to pay for that and, and make sure that we enhance it for the citizens of Broadwater County. If it is not sustainable, and we have had these problems for multiple years, in fact since uh, the inception of the hospital uh, and the original board that uh, the, the, the business, if you will, because it's, it is in a way convoluted with a private nonprofit organization taking part of the process as well as our local district taking another part of the process. But the bottom line is, is we need to make sure that those funds that are being coming from either PILT or other sources that we have available to help our, our hospital are not just being added into a hole that has been there. We have been making great strides, um, but writing off loans does not um, constitute being in good business and we need to make sure that we get all the truth and the story out on that so that the the bottom line of the hospital process is known by everyone not just what's being brought out on the front page uh, you guys remember what happened uh, in july of the year that the hospital was almost lost this county came together in a way that is impressive it was written about all over the state, and even Jay Leno talked about how we could come together and how, and a chili feed the bathroom broke. Yeah. yeah. So the hospital brought us together, and I think we need to be looking at it as a piece of who we are, a piece of our community. We had a new business move to town just recently, and the first question they asked their realtor was, do you have a hospital? The answer was yes, they moved here, they're now employing people. The hospital is a part of our economic driver. As far as helping out the hospital from time to time, we would like it to act more, a little bit more like a business, but the reality is the hospital is forced by federal law to take people, to service people, to help people who they know full well are not going to pay their bills. So it's not a business. There's business elements, but it is not a business. Sometimes it needs help. We gave a PILT infusion of $200,000 this year to the hospital. Kyle Hopstead, the CEO, took $50,000 of that and leveraged it to get a grant that he received for $500,000. So he took $50,000 and turned that into $500,000. It's a pretty darn good investment. <laughs> Using PILT to help out different agencies or different pieces of our community is not a new practice with the hospital. Three years ago, we almost lost the detention center. We gave an infusion of pill to about $350,000, and today, no Broadwater County citizens are paying for local Broadwater County inmates. Those are being paid for by the roughly 35 inmates from other counties. It's a nice benefit for us financially. Two years ago, the Sheriff's Department had a shortfall. We used PILT to infuse that with about $292,000. They are solid and they are whole. Now, to do so for the, for the hospital was following the same practice we practiced before. The hospital is getting solid. It is getting on its feet. And if the county can help with that sustainability, because it's one of the pieces of the heartbeat of this community, it's a good thing. I'm totally in favor of local delivery of health care services. I worked for the Medicare system for five years, six years actually. I saw the problems within that system. I heard about the problems from that system in the rural hospitals. 
Did you know that the rural hospitals are paid less per patient than the metropolitan hospitals? We have a real problem with our health care system now. We have a real problem with our health care delivery system now. I wish I could encourage you all, but I've worked within that system. I am so surprised that the Medicare system hasn't failed now because it was on the brink 10 and 15 years ago when I was working for it. We've heard the news today, I don't know if any of you have been listening to the news, the VA system. Some of the solutions to the problems with the VA system is one of the best solutions was brought forward by our former congressman, our senator, uh, Conrad Burns. He had a proposal in the Congress where in rural areas, such as Montana, the veterans were given a health insurance card, just like your Blue Cross Blue Shield card, or whatever carrier you have for your health insurance. Those veterans then could go to any local facility and use that facility rather than having to drive to Fort Harrison. And Fort Harrison's an excellent facility. It's one of the very few excellent facilities we have in the VA system. Or to Mile City. The system is badly broken. And I think the solution is more local delivery of health care services. Thank you. taxes have gone down because of the growth of business and I would like for you to explain to us the procedure or the, the way that tax assessment works and what you would do if the property values go up or if the business goes up if taxes will continue to go down. Okay, Tamitra. I'm not sure if I got total just to your question but if, if we look at where our taxable revenue um, comes from uh, most of that in the beginning comes from the state and and those assessments on subdivisions on property um, come from the state level and and those are handed to us we have really no say of that to to a large degree at a local level where we do have a, a little bit of room to work with is with our local taxes and, and our solid waste which is not sometimes considered a tax but uh, comes out of your pocket we have our, our um, weed, weed tax, and, and, and we look at our, our local taxable bills, and there's quite a few segments on that that do add into that. If Department of Revenue brings in a increase in values of property, that is definitely going to increase our taxable in, uh, revenue coming in. Um, that should offset, to some degree, the needs of the infrastructure, but if it if it goes the other way, uh, we are in a position where we need to pick up that shortfall um, locally. And, and that's where we really ran into a, a bind here recently with a, with a case where the Department of Revenue um, improperly assessed taxes on subdivisions here in the county, um, equating uh, a, a value, leaving the, the, the budget basically set at this level when the revenue is going to come in at a lower level. Now, with our ability to create a book keeping, if you will, uh, ability to make sure that we don't cut the services, we were able to make a, a, an adjustment um, that offset some of the um, basically reduction in taxes, but it overall it, it managed to come out um, where we did take a hit this year. But if, if that continues, and, and there is also opportunities, not opportunities, but a possibility of, of that happening again. We don't really have any control over Department of Revenue except with the exception of we need to have our local government on top of those scenarios so that we're in, in knowledge of anything like that happening again and by having a policy in place we can make sure that we're prepared rather than being caught at the 11th hour with our pants around our ankles so to speak. We need to be proactive and make sure that we're at the table when these things are being done. The question of growth came up earlier in the questions that were asked. 
Growth is a two-sided sword. When I was working as a lobbyist for Montana Association of Realtors, there's a situation on Whitefish Lake. Here's a situation. We had senior citizens who were living in retirement homes that were built 30, 40 years ago. All of a sudden, Flathead County has a huge amount of growth. You've got the Hollywood millionaires moving in there. You've got the industrials moving in there. They're building five, six hundred thousand dollar homes, and then million dollar homes, and then three million dollar homes in those neighborhoods around the lake. Those poor senior citizens that have lived there for all those years on a fixed income were being taxed out of their homes. So that's one of the problems with growth. The other side of that sword is growth brings about more properties. And with that brings about more taxes. It spreads it, it spreads it out more evenly. There is no easy solution to so many problems that we have right now in this county, in the state, and in the nation. But even myself, I talked about how we moved to this county and my taxes went down for half of what I paid on a house in East Helena that was worth half the money. I am anticipating those taxes going up on my house because since moving into it, I have finished the basement. So it's worth a lot more money. I want to pay, pay my fair amount of taxes, but yet I also want to see, how do you put this, taxation equity? Is that possible? We've got to, there are so many problems out there. And I'd also like to see a, a greater spread of taxation away from property taxes and in other tax areas. Um, thank you. So taxes, there's a variety of different classes of taxes, different business classes, residential, different agricultural classes. So when you have a piece of land and you go from a lower class rate to a higher class rate, which is usually a business or manufacturing rate, then the tax for that property goes up. When you have a project going on in the county like this, what is going on right now at Wal at uh, Graymont with the railroad tracks there at the road, all that equipment, if it's parked here in the county January 1st, is counted as business property. So Department of Revenue looks at all the business property that's in the county and adds that to our taxable value. They then look at our properties, uh, businesses, buildings, agriculture, and determine the other half of the taxable value. When those changes occur again from the low class rate to the higher is when we have our valuations increase. When the valuation increase increases, the pot that we as taxpayers need to fill in actually does not, it, it increases, but for us as individuals, it doesn't because those increases in valuation and increases in equipment taxes fill in that pot before individuals are required to do it. So that's why when you have good healthy growth and that valuation goes up from good healthy business growth, then your individuals paying into that pocket go down. It's, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but I hope that answers the question for you. Are there any more questions? I have one. a question. My name is Michael Stevenson. I'm a retired LCSW here in town. And I'm wondering what the commissioner's feelings are about the mental health situation in town and the current lack of. Okay, Roger. <laughs> My wife was an RN at St. Peter's Hospital. She's since retired. St. Peter's Hospital shut down their psych ward. I think it was a huge blow to the community. Those services are badly needed, very badly needed. I, I don't totally agree with the way some of our assistance money, our welfare money is spent, but I think
think as far as mental health services, every dollar spent on it is a dollar well spent. You know, you recently heard about the uh, gentlemen who have gone into sh theaters and shot them up, killed people. You heard about a, a, a gentleman in the South who went into school, shot a whole bunch of people. The gun rights people are all waving out on gun rights, I have guns. But you know, what so many of those people have in common is mental health issues. We see, we see the people on the streets and the homeless, and they have mental health issues. We hear about criminal acts because people have come off their medication or haven't been able to get their medication. As much as we need health issues coverage as far as health care, we, we need mental health issues covered too. Recently, this uh, particular issue here in Broadwater County, and I hate to call it an issue because it's very important, uh, was brought to brought forward with us paying uh, our share of the Tri-County mental health process into a building when none of our citizens really had access to it. We had no um, therapist, we had no staff available here in the county to take care of the needs of the county. Anybody that was in need would be in a, a really a, a poor situation happening to go to Helena or, or any services. And this put a, an additional burden on our public safety department here in the county because they're usually, if not always, the first responders to someone that needs mental health care. And so we're moving forward. We now have a committee that has been created um, to look at what our options are. I visited with one of the gentlemen that's been involved in mental health care for many, many years. And one of the things that he brought forward was the need to get this process established here in Broadwater County and sooner rather than later. And, and one of the things that he said that was really important and I think really needs to resonate throughout this room is if we don't have the support of our local government for this, it dies on the vine in every effort that goes on in Helena and at the state level. So what we need to do, and, and, and this is part of the whole process of, of restructuring, if you will, we need to have all of the players in the mental health pr uh, pr process to come to Broadwater County and sit down at the table all together and determine what the needs are and determine who the players are and what part they're going to play in establishing this. Until then, we only end up with a little piece of the puzzle coming in from this side, another piece coming from this side, and we have a hard time moving forward with that puzzle being completed. So, myself personally, I think it's a, it's a definitely a, a needed service here in the county, and, and it goes right in hand in hand with the training that's required with not only those to staff a, a facility here in, in the county, whether it be part of the hospital or, or other, but our public safety department really needs to make sure that they have the available training to deal with this properly. Because if an improperly dealt with process will, will take us out. And this all kind of ties into problems with Obamacare as well. well. All right, this is a huge issue, Mike. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, Tim is right. We did recently uh, form the Mental Health Local Advisory Council. Um, we have people representing different facets of mental health uh, representative on that council. We're not the only county. We're in a county with 11 other counties, or excuse me, we're in a region with 11 other counties, and we share our mental health resources between those counties. Um, we, each county, sends our money to the state and it is matched by the feds and the problem is not money, the problem is we cannot find a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, we, there's just too few of them. They had one that was coming down here and that's why we had a building. Uh, they had a kitchen, they were doing classes, it was a good thing. Problem is, is once the psychiatrist was gone, there was no need for a receptionist and then there was no need for a nurse and we did end up closing the building, Tim is right. We're hoping, hoping to reopen that very soon. Um, the other problem is, is it isn't just us. 
Uh, we have a working group through the Montana Association of Counties and worked recently with the governor's office. Commissioners from counties all around the state got together to talk about this. We can't find the psychiatry, neither can they. Um, this is something that is a growing problem, and I don't know what the answer is, but there are a lot of people screaming that we need to do something. A deputy told me just the other day that it's estimated that probably 80% of the people staying in Brenda's hotel probably are suffering from mental health issues that they are self-medicating. So we get back to the cost, and we get back to mistreating people who need a different form of treatment than they're currently getting. But because they're not getting what they need, they become a danger to either themselves or others. Um, with that, the Board of Crime Control is also working on this issue, mm -hmm. as is the Agency on Aging. So we're not alone. Um, probably the resources or the meetings or the individuals are not going to necessarily come to Broadwater County but we are leaving Broadwater County to work with them throughout the state. And we will continue doing that. This is a huge issue, and it's extremely important, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes. Sure. I was under the impression that we have three commissioners, and only two were mentioned twice. I'm wondering how you're going to strive to work with your fellow commissioners. Okay, let's see, Laura, first, I think. <laughs>
we have to start communicating. I've said it before, this is a team. This is an absolute team that has to work together. We cannot continue coming out and taking public swipes at, at uh, trivial, and I will add trivial, derogatory statements that are made here and there. They're unproductive. They don't do anything for the commission. They don't do anything for the teamwork. They don't do anything for the community. In the end, we all lose. The bottom line is, we have currently, we have three commissioners. Two are not even communicating with the third, and we need to fix that. And if we can fix it now, great. If we're not, let's uh, look forward to January when a new commissioner comes in and leads us to fixing that problem. Thank you. I have a huge amount of experience in compromising and working through things. I've done it on the state level in the legislature. But the first thing you need is three commissioners who are willing to work together on the issues. Right now I feel we have two and one who is not willing to work on the issues. I don't know if there's an easy solution to this. There isn't. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay. I have one. I'm sorry. My name is Christine Ramondal and I saw in the paper today where I think Montana is one of the states that is considering along with Utah and Wyoming and Nevada taking over federal lands, putting federal lands under state control. Is that a good thing for Broadwater County if they do that? And does that affect help money if they do that? Um, is that... Did you start this last night? <laughs> Again, we have kind of a unique problem here in Broadwater County compared to a lot of the rest of the United States and a lot of the rest of the counties in Montana in that we do have so much federally owned land in this county. And again, I spoke earlier about the problem with the bureaucrats and the elected officials in Washington, D.C., not realizing what our issues are. I myself are I'm totally in favor of more local control of everything. Okay, Tim. As stated in my opening, I've been involved in natural resource management decisions for 30 plus years. And one of the major problems, and continues to be so, is federal inability, or maybe refusal, if you will, to properly manage our natural resources. And that directly impacts us here in the local, uh, local government area, because that is an absolute uh, revenue source for our infrastructure as it, and, and other things. Senator Fielder and uh, Senator Vincent uh, recently went to Utah and met with uh, national leaders from across the state to discuss this issue. And what we come back with from Utah is there's a great push uh, nationally within the western states to take this action. And, and they're finding that it is legal under, under the provisions of the Enabling Act that set our states up and, and put us in a position to manage our resources. So there, there's a process here that we can start looking at and moving, how it will affect our PILT. Um, I think it would be have a more major impact on our Title I, II, and III funding uh, because those funds come from a lot of our timber sales, which have been non-existent on national forest lands for way too many years. Uh, we need to start pushing the buttons locally here to make sure that our public safety is coming into the play of resource management, specifically timber. Uh, we need to start re working on enhancing our, our mineral resources and make sure that we don't be sitting on the sidelines waiting for the federal government to th do their job. Because we all know very well, they don't do their job at all very well at any time. <laughs> Christine, thanks. Uh, Broadwater County belongs to the Association of Forested Counties. It's both a state and a federal 
group we, uh, come together as a coalition so that we have a larger voice than just one county can have on these issues. Uh, through that association, I have been working and attended two of the different presentations by Senator Fielder on this very issue. Um, there's a lot of issues and a lot of questions that go with it. And at this point, she is still in the re research phase for it. Uh, yes, if we did uh, proceed with this, we probably would lose Hilton SRS. The state doesn't pay those, just the feds. Uh, but there's other questions involved too, and this is where it gets a little bit more confusing and a little bit more murky. One is, if the state took over federal lands, who pays for the weed management and uh, other, other management that is done right now by the feds? The federal government actually pays local weed coordinators to take care of noxious weeds on their property. That would be transferred to the taxpayers of Montana. The other piece of that is, Ted Turner has enough property. What is happening in some other counties is, excuse me, some other states who have looked at this, and Arizona is one of them. Uh, and this happened a couple years ago where people were wanting to buy at the top of the Grand Canyon. So we bring federal lands into the state of Montana, taxes go up, and we say we don't want to pay for this anymore. And who runs in on a white horse to buy all of that public property? Ted Turner. Is Ted Turner going to allow hunting? Probably not. Um, that becomes the question. Are we running the risk then of our public lands going into the hands of somebody who's going to fence it off and close it off to public use? Once that's done, it's done. So these are some of the questions that at this point not answered, um, but Senator Fielder is working on it and she is putting together some good presentations. So they're definitely worth watching, worth going to if you haven't happened to see what she's Close by. Thanks. It looks like we have no further questions. Harold? I'm a 26 year uh, resident of Broadwater County. And uh, the question that I have for the uh, commissioners, or commissioners, one of these. If elected, what will you as a commissioner do about the nepotism and cronyism that's going on in the county today? Okay, that would be Tim first. I have down here. That issue has bothered me for quite a while. I've watched our local government, both here at the county level and at the city level, um, with, with this issue raised. Now you can question and, and, and can go into the gray area and decide whether it is nepotism or whether it's cronyism or whether it's a combination of the two. But the bottom line is it becomes a conflict of interest when you have these types of situations in play, when you're trying to do the business for the people of the, of the county. We need to make sure that when we have our department heads and our employees that are working on this, that we're not working towards a sweetheart deal, if you will. Uh, Commissioner Obert has recently stated that we will uh, be moving forward because the good old days of, of hiring our buddies is over with. But I think it's pr probably in large part alive and well when you look, get behind the scenes and look at this. I personally, as the next commissioner for Broadwater County, can proudly state that I don't have any skin in any of the games. I don't have any relation working for the county. I don't have any uh, parts of, of uh, interest in any of the boards or the departments. I'm, I'm an independent citizen taxpayer with an interest to do the best for the citizens of Broadwater County. Um, if there was a certain opportunity to find a conflict there, I would certainly welcome how it could be done. But uh, it's just part of making sure that we build this team, and I think I'm best qualified to say that I can make that happen. Thanks, Harold. Earlier I stated that we were investigating and working at getting uh, human resource and personnel services for the county. We didn't have that for a very long time. We are under legal direction right now by our insurance carrier to get that. Um, the other thing is, uh, I said earlier, too, that we need to be looking at issues with the long view. That's this issue as well. We have a serious problem in the county with nepotism and cronyism. 
and we need to address it. The problem is, is once somebody is hired, it is extremely difficult to fire them, especially if it's for something like nepotism or cronyism, because those are not uh, any, any of the grounds that you have for actually getting rid of people. So we're stuck with what we have, but the best we can do at this point is make sure that supervisors are not uh, over their family members, and we can move forward. What we need to do is have a solid human resource department that walks every single department head through the hiring process. There are